incredibly excited to have Val head here to talk to us about animation and responsive design. I feel like one of the things that has happened over the last five years or so has been that user expectations of our ability to build behavior and animation has skyrocketed, and I don't feel like I've kept up, which is why I love watching and reading what Val writes, so I'm incredibly happy to have her here. Please welcome Val Head. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Uh, like every, yeah, I'm super excited to be in Portland again. It's really fun. I like your city. It reminds me, it reminds me of my city, which is cool. Um, a lot of people can, no, it's good. A lot of people are oh, like, if you go to Portland, it's going to remind you of Pittsburgh. They're so similar. And they're kind of right. I don't know. Anyways, I always thought that was like a fake thing they were telling me to get to come out to the West Coast, but it's not. <laughs> Anyways, like Jason said, I talk a lot about animation. And today I want to talk about it specifically in the context of responsive design. Because he set me up perfectly well talking about, you know, mentioning how you know, people expect different things from interfaces these days. Because of all the fancy touch screens in our pockets, people expect certain behaviors and things that the web just hasn't done for a very long time. Uh, we just haven't been able to, but now we can. We have like proper web standard animation options. We can make animations that look awesome, are progressively enhanced, are accessible and responsive. And like no other medium can do that, so clearly we are better than all of the rest of them. <laughs> I feel like my logic is pretty sound. I'm glad you guys agree. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about all of those, because it's only 20 minutes, but I specifically want to talk about how we can make them responsive. Because one of these other things that comes up on the internet a lot is how responsive design is killing creativity and design all sucks and looks the same. And I think that's kind of dumb, too. It's like, be, the fact that we need to make things responsive doesn't mean they can be any less designed or any less interesting or any less performant. We have all sorts of options. So there's kind of three things that come up a lot when it comes to animation and responsive design that I see people running into little problems. Um, I'm going to give you solutions to all three of them, but specifically it's the idea of um, when we have motion and then we take it down to this smaller stage of smaller viewports, suddenly it gets a little jumbled and harder to understand. Like that different staging, that different context gets difficult. Um, sometimes we have animations that have really good content and then when we scale them down, we're like, oh, we can't. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work. That's too small, can't read that. So that's another one. And then also animation and performance. Performance is kind of a big deal. Don't know if you've heard. Um, we like things to be fast and zippy and to be responsive in the sense like we touched a thing, something should respond, not just necessarily squishy. So two different kinds of responsive. So the first problem is that motion becomes distracting in smaller spaces. Wonky, sad face. <laughs> Isn't he cute though? I want him everywhere. <laughs> So the easiest solution to that is to simplify motion for smaller spaces. And this particularly applies to um, animation that moves things around. Uh, if you want to get like super, I don't know, geeky about it, not all animation is motion. We can animate things like opacity and color and blurs, and that doesn't move, that just animates. But when we translate things like across the screen or up and down, that's motion, and this can get us into this sort of problem. An example is this kind of awesome menu. Actually, this completely awesome menu. I love this menu. It's so exciting. Um, I'll show it to you first. This guy folds down in 3D, comes back up. Pretty nice. And I know you can't tell because it's video, but it's also keyboard accessible. Bonus points. <laughs> But they have this great little fold action going on. It's very much part of the design. That motion is there to show you this idea that their menu is unfolding. They have those kind of two, two sides of the triangles unfolding, those two triangles kind of doing their little 3D flip. And that's what does the entire visual communication of this menu is unfolding. Well, imagine, before I show you, what happens if you put that into a skinnier space or a smaller viewport? Suddenly we have these two triangles that are going to like cross and do this weird thing and like that's not unfolding, that's just like origami. I guess. I don't know. It's not going to be good. So um, this is Rally Interactive, their site, which I forgot to say before, but that's who it is. And so they simplified the motion to keep that main thing about the motion, which is the unfolding, but make it make sense in a narrower space. So they just did this. Changed it slightly. It's more than just getting rid of one of those. They changed the one that's left. So it's like, unfold. Here's your menu. And you're like, this is great! You know, the, the, the design and the concept isn't lost, but it makes a whole lot more sense on that smaller stage, and we don't have this weird crossing or extra nonsense. So way to go, Rally Interactive. This also comes up for SI Digital or C Digital. I don't know. I'm going with SI Digital. If anyone works there and wants to tell me how to really say their name, go ahead. 
they have this uh, really great background illustration where their whole concept is they are like this chemistry lab of digital advertising, I think. Anyways, here's how it goes. It's this great little illustration. It's like, hey, check out my, group, my pink stuff. It's going through. Hey, you should maybe scroll. It's pretty fun having someone narrate the internet, isn't it? And you scroll, and you're like, yay, cool, check this out. Not just as their agency, yes. Oh, and here comes my favorite part. They reveal the secret that we all know but have never told anyone. Responsive design is actually pouring pink goo into a variety of screens. <laughs> Just wait for it, wait for it. Uh-huh, right, right? I mean, I'm pointing to the wrong thing, but we, I, I thought that was a secret. I didn't know we could tell people. Anyways, this illustration is like the main way they're communicating this digital lab space. And again, like with Rally Interactive, if you imagine this on a smaller screen, you see all those twisty bumps and stuff, you can just imagine this turning into like a one pixel wide set of nonsense that you can't understand. And the visual communication would be completely lost because you'd be like, is that a pink ribbon? A, I don't know, Pepto? I don't get it. Um, so you might think, oh, I'll show you a quick preview of their mobile or their smaller version. Um, and at first it looks like they got rid of the illustration entirely and you're a little bit sad. Um, but then you find out they actually just simplified the illustration. They actually took that illustration, focused on just, just what was most important. They didn't just like shrink it down or just focus into part of it. They kind of redid it. There's no stuff flowing into the devices on this one. Um, but initially, I just thought they turned off the animation. But that's not really what they did. They refocused their illustration and made it make more sense for that smaller space. Because even with these fewer pipes going on, it would be awkward to see that, uh, that, that pink stuff animating through the blood of responsive design, I guess. Responsive design is pink blood. Cool. Anyways, <laughs> remember these guys because they're going to come up again in a minute. So another problem, animation that is totally not readable on smaller viewports, wonky sad face. Good way to, a good solution to this is a term I totally made up just for this talk, responsive choreography. Sounds pretty, doesn't it? You're like, yay, cool. It's all dancing. So I ran into this in a project I worked on earlier this year, um, which was a very uh, upbeat site about the Pennsylvania, state of Pennsylvania pensions. Happiness. Um, <laughs> no. But what they wanted to have is a set of illustrations showing off some of the data about these pensions, some of the very depressing data. So this is how we did it on you know, nice wide viewports, where you're like, cool, left to right, we can stack these, th or line these three facts up right next to each other. Um, easy, no problem. And they're gonna run left to right, so we know, I mean, their tops are all lined up, so we know that once we can see them in view, we can start number one, and once he's done, we can wait a second or whatever, fraction of a second, play number two, and after that we can play number three. And we can be reasonably sure those are going to be seen in a logical like, order, and they're gonna make sense. You're like, left to right, cool, we're good to go. Um, and also, one of the things I was thinking, I'm like, we'll do the animations in SVG, so when things get smaller, it just scales beautifully and everything will be wonderful and we'll be happy. Uh, wait, I was supposed to show you this while I said that. It's SVG and everything will scale and it'll be wonderful and beautiful and everything will be perfect. Oh, crap. There was, there was definitely a point in this project where I did exactly that. I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> we have a problem. Later today, we can talk about my love-hate relationship with SVG. <laughs> but I'll show you how I fix this. So I'm like, okay, we do this a lot, right? We have content going left to right on the web all the time. We're like, hey, play the first thing. Oh, play the first thing, view that timeline, play the second thing, view that timeline, play the third thing. And effectively, we have one, one timeline going on across all three. Like, you know, we do that on the web with other things that we're reading that aren't necessarily animation. And uh, we just like stack them, right? No big deal. Easy in one, on one hand, but the problem is that if you stack them, and especially if you're on something like a phone, how do we know when to start number two? Because we can't guarantee you're scrolling at the same rate the animation is playing, right? Because we all scroll very consistently. I know I work on my thumb muscles to scroll at an even pace, uh, but I'm a little weird. Uh, so we needed to track a couple of different things. I needed to check which animation was in view once they were stacked and change things. So instead of having one timeline to play all three, we had a timeline here, a timeline there, and a timeline there. So we could play them each independently. It starts sounding like a pretty crazy like high school math logic problem, doesn't it? You're like, if like Ben went to the store and bought four apples and ate one. Um, <laughs> but it's really not as complicated as it, uh, as it, as it maybe looks in this diagram. Um, since I was using JavaScript to animate the SVGs, it was pretty simple, especially because I was using a library kind of built for this, to break out the separate timelines and do something more like this. 
We're like, hey, number one is in view, play his thing. Number two is in view, go you. And well, you can see how three goes. Um, so the main reason I was able to pull this off was that I used um, the GreenSock library, or the GreenSock animation library to animate these SVGs, which allows you to actually separate timelines. Um, you can also do that by yourself, I mean on your own by hand if you're into that, uh, but I like saving time and having other people write things that are smarter than I can write. So there's that idea of sometimes when we get to different size viewports, especially smaller ones, we have to reorganize the way the animation plays to, st to still make it make sense which is still a million times better than just being like, ah, kill the animation, who cares? No one needs it. So it's good stuff that way. Another way this comes into play is, this is kind of more of an art direction problem. It's a little less code and diagram problem. And I should play it while I drink water, but that's okay. So this is the, um, Stripe made a site for their, um, their payment app. I think it's called Dashboard. It might not be, but whatever, I'm calling it Dashboard. Oh, it is called Dashboard, cool. Um, so they have this great site they put together. And this site is one we see a lot on the web these days, where it's like the only point of this site is to entice you to download this app, because it's an iPhone app. So on their big, super wide uh, view, they have the, the phone kind of go in and be like, hey guys, and it skews, and it's wonderful. Um, I'm a member of the Giant Giant Monitor Club, so I get to see this in full 34-inch glory. Interestingly, they've done two different things. They've changed this animation both in what it shows to show you something that makes sense to you and how it enters based on both how wide and how tall your viewport is. Vertical and horizontal, like, oh, awesome. So if you had a shorter window because your monitor wasn't giant like mine, the iPhone would be straight on at you. So of course it has to enter in a different way to make it make sense. You know, it comes up from the bottom. Now they know where the bottom is, they know their iPhone can take up the whole space, and it'd be really weird if like this thing that was flat on like came out and skewed and then unskewed itself. You'd be like, what are you doing? That's just odd. So they adapted the motion that it used to enter with the end layout, which is really, really cool. And then when things get super, super small, they ditch the phone entirely, and well, this is probably very much take advantage of the way most phone things work with video. There's just a button to click, the to click into the video and see it separately. But I thought they handled that really well. Like they kept the integrity of their design. It looks beautiful. You get that demo of like what the app looks like on all three of the places I showed you, or all three sizes, uh, and everywhere in between. But they also adapted the motion so it still made sense to what you saw in the end result. Which I'm like, yeah, go Stripe. They're one of my favorites. They do animation so good. Just want to give them all high fives. So the other end of, of, it, of animation and responsive design is the idea of performance. Responsive isn't just like the squishiness stuff, it's also about having things feel like a conversation and respond to you in a meaningful like, amount of time. So a problem that happens sometimes, animation is slow and sad, and that makes me sad, especially on less powerful devices, wonky sad face. That's how I will end every sentence and conversation in the panel, it's gonna be great. So remember our friends SI Digital with their crazy uh, responsive design blood going on. I have a theory that one of the other reasons they took out the animation on the very uh, smaller viewports is because they were doing animation in a way that was very unperformant. Don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> darn, this is being recorded, isn't it? Um, this is just my theory. I haven't actually talked to them about it. But all of this stuff that's kind of flowing through the pipes is done by animating uh, the width and top and left position of some images. And there's a lot of pink little images filling up all of those pipes. So my guess is that maybe that didn't play so well on phones. That maybe it got a little bit studier, uh, stutterier, or you know those other words people used to describe slow animation that I don't think we should that I don't like saying because um, it reminds me of jegging. So I can't I can't say that word. <laughs> Anyways. To avoid that situation where you might have an animation that you love on desktop, powerful things, but you see on smaller, less powerful devices, and you're like, oh, no, 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 that's not how it's supposed to play back. The easiest way to avoid that is to stick with the most performant properties we have. Um, like, they're all CSS properties, but this applies whether you're animating in CSS or JavaScript or whatever else you might come up with. Um, I guess for SVG as well, but CSS transforms an SVG, that goes into my love-hate relationship, so off the table for now. Um, if we stick to things like transform, which covers a lot, right? That gives us like position, scale, rotation, and then opacity, which is always a surprise to me. I thought opacity was expensive stuff. It's not, browsers are like, sweet, 
a pacify more stuff. Come on, hide more things, bring it on. They can do so many. So there's a lot we can cover with those, pretty much all the basics of motion that we use, just with those two properties. So if you stick to those, they'll be a lot faster. I was gonna say a billion thousand times faster, but just noticeably more performant. If you're ever wondering uh, which CSS properties are most performant, or if you need to get away from transform and opacity, because honestly they don't cover everything you might want to move, there's a really great site that Paul Lewis put together called CSS Triggers, and it actually shows you which properties affect layout, paint, and composite operations. The fewer dots you have, the faster and more performant things will be. The more dots you have, the better chances of wonky sad face. <laughs> So it's a really great one to look up things, especially because there are times when opacity and transforms don't cover what you need to get done. There's even more advanced tricks if you want. There are things like the Translate 3D hack. It's kind of a hack, not really what we're supposed to do. It essentially means you put a fake 0% 3D rotation on something that's not actually 3D to promote itself to a new layer and get all hardware accelerated. It's great. Um, Browsers apparently didn't like that we were doing that to them, even though it works. So the will change property is a new thing that you should be using instead, a little bit more complicated, but it also gives us more control over what we promote and what gets that extra like attention from the browser. You know, if you have an animation that's maybe being a little sluggish and you really need it to be good because it's something that really um, speaks to your brand or is a core interaction, you wanna look at this stuff. Super smart, uh, super smart Sarah Sweden wrote an article that is everything you need to know about the CSS will change property. It does not disappoint. Seriously, you should read it like 100 times because um, everything you need to know is in there and why you might want to use it. The very last problem is the idea of everyone hates waiting, but sometimes loading things takes time. Mm. Now, not all things that take time or that are loading are things we have control over, but oftentimes if we have to like get new information or find, you know, contact the server or whatever else, we know that there's gonna be some waiting time and that people will have to wait and they won't like it. Conveniently, animation takes time by definition and can be used to fill that time really well and actually make it seem like it goes faster. Proceed performance, if you will. People have studied this in academic circles and they have found things like, hey, our findings indicate that the psychological mechanisms of transitions is completely different than progress bars. So apparently, people think Whatever is happening is happening faster if you show them some hint of content instead of like a progress bar or like a spinner. Kind of crazy. Not really. It seems to make sense. And I love that they actually studied that. So that's why we see a lot of this going on on the web these days of, you know, hinting at a little skeleton content because it really works. It makes us feel like things are loading faster. Bonus. Also this one where it's not really indicating the content but that extra little bit and they still have the spinner but hey, whatever. Makes it feel like it's going a bit faster too. Um, Thinkit Labs also did some really interesting research on this where they looked at, hey, there's some cases where we need to show a loader, we can't show any skeleton content, we can't hit, hint at the content, we just don't know what it is yet. How long will people wait? And will the style of loader influence how long they will wait? Really interesting results. They kind of came down to the fact that the better designed and more visually interesting loaders, people would wait longer without being like upset about it. Um, there's also, if you've ever read this seductive UI book, uh, in there, the author suggests that loaders that have fewer cycles, like if this loader spinner only spins twice, even if it takes it like three seconds to go around once, we feel like it happened faster because we only saw the repetition twice. I love the idea that like somewhere in our subconscious, we're counting the rotations of a loader. I mean, I don't do that on purpose, but apparently we do. Humans are so like complex and amazing. So the idea, the perceived performance, you can really use animation to make things feel like they're happening faster, even when they're not, because sometimes we can't actually make things happen faster. So that's kind of the uh, oh, preview of some problems of how you can fix them if you run into them with animation and continue being creative and making amazing, um, cool behaviors and really fun interactions that are useful and good and responsive. So thanks so much, guys. <laughs>